I want to make it very, very clear. This is very early days for us. I appreciate personally, thank you. I lift my hands to you, to each and every one of you for helping us get that story out there. This is the very beginning. So again, you're gonna to wanna to delve into places that we're not ready to talk about for a multitude of reasons. On May 27th, the Tkumloop Shishwem First Nation Band released a press release that shook the world. Cook Bee Chief Roseanne Casimir stated that there had been a discovery of the remains of 215 former students of the Kamloops Indian Residential School through the use of ground penetrating radar. It was a heartbreaking story that made headlines across Canada and the world alike. Since then, emotions have understandably ran high, but so has speculation and rumors stated by sources of prominent influences, such as politicians, as well as mainstream media. It's been two weeks since that press release was published, and all of us are left with more questions than answers when it comes to things like exactly how was the precise figure of 215 determined with such technology, and by whom? Is the discovery being treated like a crime scene, or rather like an unmarked cemetery that was known about, but only just now being located? Will there be a thorough investigation to let us know more about the identity of those who were buried there as well as their cause of death? And what were the recent events that led up to the discovery? And now that it's been discovered, what does the ban want to do now? We went there to find out. What you just saw there was a taste of the culture and the ceremonies taking place after this heartbreaking story hit front page news worldwide. But some of the stories that were spread far and wide were not based on facts. For example, how were the remains buried? Were they found in a mass grave hiding dark, horrendous secrets? Or is this a lost cemetery? The initial press release, which you can find at rebelnews.com, only stated the following. It is with a heavy heart that the Tecumloop Shishwemek Kupi chief, Roseanne Casimir, confirms an unthinkable loss that was spoken about but never documented by the Kamloops Indian Residential School. This past weekend, with the help of a ground-penetrating radar specialist, the stark truth of the preliminary findings came to light. The confirmation of the remains of 215 children who were students of the Kamloops Indian Residential School. We had a knowing in our community that we were able to verify. To our knowledge, these missing children are undocumented deaths, stated Cook B. Roseanne Casimir. Some were as young as three years old. We sought out a way to confirm the knowing out of the deepest respect and love of those lost children and their families, understanding that the Tkumloop Shishwemek is the final resting place of these children. Those two paragraphs were the only parts in the statement to offer the general public with some insight about who was buried there and why. Now, surely it was vague enough to allow the general public to come off with their own speculations, but what excuse did politicians and news outlets have for embellishing the facts? Is it for their own political reasons? And don't they understand that with a matter so sensitive, their words carry weight and can actually harm people if what they're saying isn't true? Take a look at this letter from Jagmeet Singh dated May 31st. He wrote that there was a recent discovery of 215 children placed in a mass unmarked grave. The New York Times, the National Post and the Toronto Star all bombarded us with articles saying the same thing, that a mass grave was discovered here. That implied something horrific, like a massacre or something done in secret and in shame. But is it a mass grave? 
where these children just discarded like pieces of garbage, one on top of the other until it was eventually covered up? Or were they individually buried over a certain period of time? To get to these answers, again, I stress, let's go to the people closest to this situation. Acknowledging that they're coming from a place of trauma and grief, to Kamloops, to Shwet McChief, Roseanne Kazmir gave the first update to the media since news broke of the horrifying apparent find last week. Among the things she wanted to clarify, they are not calling this a mass grave. This is not a mass grave, but rather unmarked burial sites that are, to our knowledge, also undocumented. When Justin Trudeau came out and stated what was found, Jody Wilson-Raybolt replied on Twitter saying this. The killing of innocent children is horrific. What is distressing is your government focusing on symbolism and half measures rather than real action. In 2018, you promised to break the pattern of past governments. You abandoned that promise and nothing has changed. Don't get me wrong, I totally agree with Jody. We're tired of politicians just saying what people want to hear, especially capitalizing off the suffering of other people. But were these children killed? Does anybody want the truth of what happened to them? And I mean each and every one of them out. It's been difficult to get the answers about what is likely to be the cause of death of those who are buried in unmarked graves near the school. On the one hand, this is such a challenging thing for many people to discuss, especially those closest to Canada's dark history with residential schools that includes the kidnapping, the neglect, both the physical and sexual abuse and stripping away of culture of innocent children. And we also know that we're nowhere near knowing all of those stories because many people, including people in my own family who attended residential schools, were never comfortable talking about their experiences there, leaving their family just wondering what they may have endured. But on the other hand, as a journalist, it's been difficult for me to get answers on this particularly because it seems like for whatever reason, every single door that I would normally take to do so is getting closed on me. While we were there, every staff person that we spoke to on the grounds told us they couldn't answer any questions unless it was approved first by their elected chief. I still haven't heard back from the band's office about how to get a statement or arrange an interview to do so yet. Why is the chief, an elected political leader, the only one who's allowed to speak on this? Is it a cultural protocol thing or something else? Additionally, the archives that are available to do research on the school have been closed as well. And in a recent press release, we were all but told not to ask questions at all, just to wait for the band to tell us what they want to tell us and when. I want to make it very, very clear. This is very early days for us. I appreciate personally, thank you. I lift my hands to you, to each and every one of you for helping us get that story out there. This is the very beginning. So again, you're gonna to wanna to delve into places that we're not ready to talk about for a multitude of reasons. We are a First Nations community. We are part of the Shwetmach Nation, which means we have ceremonies and protocols to do yet. So you have to understand that there's things that we're not gonna disclose until we've had the chance to connect within our own community who is reeling, because unfortunately, how this story was, we knew that we had to push it out at the same time to the general public as to our own community here. And so they're still reeling and they still have the presence of those children in their community. So we just want you to be very aware with what we're dealing with here. Now granted, it's just been under a couple of weeks and with a story like this, I imagine they're getting questions after questions as well as concerns from around the world. But typically, in order to bring the public information, there is at least a media person who can let the press know what can and cannot be answered. Despite many of the journalistic doors that have been closed on me as I've been trying to prepare this report for you, I was able to get some insight on some of the possible causes of death that could have occurred to those who've been buried in unmarked graves near the school. I was able to do some research about mortality in the area during the time the school was open. And I was also able to speak to two elders who attended the school like this gentleman. 
I'm sad about those children. Yes. It's really bad. Yeah. I spent 11 years here. My wife spent 14. At the school? Yeah. And I'll tell you the truth, I didn't like it. Well, I believe you. Did you know that uh, there was children buried here? No, I just, I just heard it not too long ago. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. While that gentleman wasn't aware about the remains of these children, the community itself has heard about stories for a long time. The initial press release from the local tribe also says that preliminary measures have been taking place since as early as the year 2000 to get to where they are today in this investigation. Another elder who we talked to, Stanley Paul, actually told us he resided for years in one of the upper rooms up front. I'm going to brace you. Some of what he has to say is very disturbing. But he also points out that accidents took place, like this accident that happened to his own cousin. Do you think many in the community, they also knew that there were babies and children that were buried here? I know I have some some new cousins some cousins here. We were in school a long time. See, you know, I used to and I used to go to school here. We used to be back here where we used to have apples and all that there. Mm -hmm. Where the cows, we used to have the cows and pigs and chickens and all that. And that day we had to well, look after the boys, we used to look after the boys for the horses and all that. Mm -hmm. Then we had that we had that hay. That hail, then we used to jump through all that hay over to the horses and the cow and all that. And we would fire when we jump and it's all that hay and everything down. Mm -hmm. And the guy and the guy and the, the boy, our little cousin, it threw, it threw that hay on the ground. And we forgot when we when were jumping, we are running and everything, running and around, jumping over the hay. The hay. When, when we found out, it one of our cousins, it fell into that thing and, and it, what he did, it poked him and they killed him right there and the thick and they sinned and we seen it and we were, we were all happy to see him but when they come out and they come out to death when he died that hurt at us because and I was a really good friend and what happened you know what I was really good he was just like a half brother and everything when he died and made me even cry too. Were there a lot of accidents like that that happened here? Or? Yeah, and then over here, there were some of them, some of them girls, weather good, weather good, good. On the girl side, that wasn't good there down there. So for the girls, when you wash them for the water and we do the wash their clothes and all that there. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission has come together to provide an avenue for many of the people who attended residential schools and also their family members to provide their stories, which unfortunately include deaths from things like tuberculosis, as well as from poor living conditions. This particular residential school ran from 1890 to 1978, during a time when tuberculosis was one of the leading causes of death. So much so that according to Kamloops Museum Archives, a place now known as the Tranquil Farm Fresh was first a large sanitarium built specifically to treat patients with tuberculosis between 1907 in 1958. An article about the sanatorium by Kamloops Info News states that before Europeans came to the area, First Nations people frequented the land for fishing and hunting. After colonization, tuberculosis began ravaging Canadian communities, especially First Nations. It appears we're not the only one having a tough time getting some answers. If you look at this CBC article, it talks about a little bit of a struggle between the RCMP who's trying to do an investigation and the expert who did the technology that was used to come up with this very precise number of 215 students who are laid here in unmarked graves.
A retired senator and former chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada named Marie Sinclair has criticized the local RCMP after he learned they are beginning to question those that have made the story available. Sinclair reportedly accused the police of intimidating people involved with the search, stating Mounties should not be pursuing those who are revealing information, such as researchers. He also said that the young lady who was the one who did the research on the ground penetrating radar, for example, was quite scared of the approach that the RCMP had taken with her and that he has since advised her, as well as others, to obtain legal counsel to prevent that from happening again. So I guess for now, the burning question that many of you have about how the unnamed expert mentioned in the tribe's initial press release was able to use ground penetrating radar technology to determine exactly, not approximately, 215 bodies, no more or no less, of children as young as three, is one that the RCMP and journalists are not exactly welcome to find out. Now, I'm certainly far from a radar specialist, but Global News did a report interviewing somebody from Geoscan in Vancouver. Now, they weren't involved in this particular case, but they did clearly explain that the technology isn't really an exact science. Take a look at this. Who builds a school with a cemetery attached? Well, the Canadian government does so and, and did so. But as useful as this technology might be, Geoscan says it's important to understand its limitations. GPR, magnetometry, and even electromagnetic conductivity doesn't work like an X-ray. While it can help determine depth, shape, and size, there is still much that remains secret beneath the soil. It's not going to give you a black and white answer, but uh, it's going to pinpoint to the right direction most of the time. It's not an exact uh, survey. While some conclusions can be drawn from the data, Experts in the field say there's only one way to get 100% certainty. You would have to dig, you would have to do a proper investigation. Nothing will uh, essentially um, give you better results than daylighting. But will the band allow an archaeological dig of any kind for more answers? And exactly what type of investigation will the band feel is appropriate? In a previous statement, the BC coroner's office stated that they had been made aware of the discovery and were early in the process of gathering information and would continue to work collaboratively with the Tecumloop Shishwemek as the sensitive work progressed. More recently, the BC coroner office responded to my inquiry to follow up on how that gathering of information has gone and to ask if they would be permitted to examine the remains for evidence of trauma. Their office responded saying that they had offered any assistance within their mandate and at the request of the band council are now awaiting further information about their consultant's report, adding that it would be inappropriate to speculate about their involvement until that time. I also tried to reach out for an updated statement from Superintendent Sidney Leckie about what the RCMP's current role is in the investigation. Superintendent Leckie reiterated what was said in an earlier statement, which includes that the band remains as the lead official at this time. The RCMP will continue to support the band in determining next steps, and any further actions will be taken in consultation with the Tecumloop Shishwemek First Nations. We are all still left with more questions than answers when it comes to the magnitude of exactly what's been discovered near the school. I'm Drea Humphrey for Rebel News, and I'll be following this story closely and keeping you updated.